Welcome to the Fabulous 413. I'm Monty Belmonte. And I'm Kali Smith. Later in the show, we'll speak with David Brule and Amalia Forhawks, both of whom are a part of the Pecumtech Homelands Festival. The festival itself is celebrating its 10th year this weekend in Great Falls, and we'll speak to the two of them about the great importance of enduring events like this and some of the events that will be happening along the banks of the river at Unity Park. But first, tomorrow night, Wednesday, August 2nd, there'll be a gathering in Northampton just beside the Masonic Street parking lot to celebrate a well-known mural getting a bit of a facelift. I remember people saying to me when I said we were going to do a mural on women's history, and they said, well, that's a small mural. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out not. <laughs> 3,500 square feet. Jokes on you, folks. <laughs> Jokes on you. I am woman, hear me roll. We're on Masonic Street in Northampton, where right now a restoration is in progress of a gigantic mural, the history of women in Northampton from 1600 to 1980, copyright Hestia, Art Collective, and we're joined by three members of the Hestia Art Collective. What's your name? Linda Bond, Susan Pontius, Mariah Fee. The mural was created when? Well, we ban- began the process in 1978, and it took two years for fundraising, research, drawing. We spent a year on the drawing, and then the entire summer of 1980 painting the mural. So how did the Hestia Collective come about? It, it was, was a, a beginning of a kind of feminist group, but it had a diverse group of people, you know, married women, artists. It was a group that got together, and we all, I think, were going for the first time to a meeting, and people were talking about their work and showing their work, and at the very end of the meeting, Shelley Shikoff said, I'm interested in doing a public art piece. If anybody is interested, can you stick around? So there were probably about a dozen of us that sat around and spoke, and most of us were painters. And we had a couple of meetings, and then we decided we wanted to do a mural, and that it would be about women's, about some kind of feminist subject. And so by the time we really got moving, there were five of us left. Because some people dropped out because it was just too demanding, or their lives you know, were pulling them in other directions. So the five of us ended up beginning with the research and the let's look for a wall and this was like oh Oh, the biggest in the town that's that's us that's a good place to start (laughs) the most exposed so we were go big or go home (laughs) right it was really important to me that we had an artwork that not only express our concerns in terms of women's uh, art roles and and in, in in the community and uh, in history, but also was brought the community together. I'm not interested in divisive. Right. I want people to feel like, you know, it belongs to them. And it was so controversial at the time, I never used the word feminism. <laughs> I talked about what it was, but I knew as soon as that came out of my mouth, uh, people would go at that time in the 80s to bra burning and they had Man-hating. ideas. Yeah, that, that, that they had Not that ideas. anybody's doing that right now. Not that, <laughs> yeah, that's with, what a, I mean, with a Barbie was, movie or yeah. anything. <laughs> yes, yes, things are all good now. Uh, no. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Don't take that out of context. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no. it, it, it's kind of frightening that maybe not that much has changed. We but we came so far, yeah. and now we're going backwards. Yeah. How prescient it was in 1980 for us to paint this mural. We. We're really, I think, on the cutting edge of that, and I think that's pretty exciting. Well, this was a center for that. Yeah. There was a kind of underground women's movement that was slowly building. And it was called second wave feminism, yeah. but, and then it ended. <laughs> then it ended. You did a lot of the research, Susan? Uh, yes, well, joined by my colleagues, but um, I, I'm, history is always a uh, particular interest of mine. I did really do throw myself into the research and was really thrilled that we were able to do original research and uh, put it all together, not only in the mural, but actually in a booklet that I wrote that documents all that history, as well as not only what's on the mural, but things that we couldn't put in the mural. Uh, and that has been used uh, as a, a teaching device in the local schools uh, and even at Smith College as well. Well, 380 years is a long window to choose from for the <laughs> history of women in Northampton. And the mural is big, but it's not that big to be so all-encompassing. So where does one begin? Where should we begin by when we're talking about who's depicted in this mural? 
Well, one of the things that we did, which was to highlight some of the prominent women, like Sophia Smith, Sojourner Truth, but also to represent women like in agriculture, so a native, native women, uh, women in the arts, women at home. So these are anonymous people who represent, you know, things that women were doing to support the communities. One of the things that strikes me when you first look at the mural, all the way over in the left-hand corner is a quilt, and then a woman painting on a quilt. Who, who's that woman depict? That's Susan Lathrop. Susan Lathrop was a, a local artist, and she, with her sisters, opened up a, a studio in the downtown area. And the quilt represents local domestic arts, women's arts of the time period and to today. So we thought that the quilt was a good representation of that time, carrying into the present. Um, and up above that is the hearth, the fire, which symbolically is connected to our collective that, that we formed called Hestia. Because Hestia was a goddess of the home, is that right? Goddess of the hearth and the home. Mm. And she was displaced by a, a male god. Um, we were down below, uh, pictures. The Hestia Collective, the, the Hestia. five of you. I was playing a guessing game earlier to see if I could recognize who of you three is up there where, and I only got one right. Right, <laughs> right, right, only one right. Well, it, it was restored in 2003. Uh -huh. and, Did uh, you bring it up to date to where, where you looked at then? A bit, me especially. For some reason, she <laughs> took my glasses off. I, um, and so, but we're represented there. The artists of the area were kind of more symbolic. It's not like, look at me. We all went to school here, graduate school here. Wednesday went to Smith. Um, Susan, Linda, and myself, Mariah, uh, we went to UMass. Mm -hmm. Actually, the woman that is really doing a lot of painting in the, the current restoration, Rebecca Muller, she went to UMass also. It was updated and restored. So what changed in the 2003 restoration? Linda Bond. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were very concerned about any change in the composition because we had spent so long organizing this compositionally and felt that adding anything anywhere wouldn't be, wouldn't be um, wise. So what we did do and what the, the, res the uh, restoration team did was change some of the anonymous people to figures who were actual figures that lived here. Let's walk the course of the mural. So how, how long, how big is this mural? 35 by 100 feet. Yeah. It's big. Did I hear this is the largest this is mural? The, this is, it was, the, it was not only the first mural in Western Massachusetts, it is still the largest. It may well have been the first mural in the country that celebrated women's history in this way. Since then, of course, there's been many others, but I believe it is perhaps the first that celebrated uh, women's history, certainly on this scale. And you know, the tobacco industry was oh, a big okay. industry in the 1800s and uh, early, you know, uh, 20th century. The tobacco was still there. We show the colonial woman who did receive uh, medicinal information and planting information from the indigenous, from the Indians of the area. Paradise. There's Paradise Pond in the middle. So all of us did, uh, in the original um, presentations, we each chose a subject or a, a figure to depict in our own personal styles. My topic was Smith College, so I did a portrait of Sophia Smith and the gates and the pond behind. Who's that scientist right there in front of the gates of Smith? That's Helen Kiley. Actually, her niece, Maureen, was in touch with us, and she was very excited to see that the mural was going to be restored, and she came down here last week with some, some uh, snacks for the <laughs> painters, which was really sweet. We're in Northampton on Masonic Street in front of the... History of Women in Northampton from 1600 to 1980 mural with the Hestia Art Collective, who created this mural back then and who's helping to restore it right now. In 1980, was there pushback from the community when you decided you were going to put a 3,500 square foot uh, mural that depicted all women up? Uh, there was some concern. <laughs> <laughs> from whom? Well, like they didn't have Facebook well, the then, first, so trolls couldn't be just commenting it's on the. It's difficult for many people to visualize, yeah. and yes. I think that's true. Uh, most people 
can't have a picture. I think when we were starting off, and we, especially when we got into the drawing, I could actually see it up on the wall. A number of us didn't want to give up because we, we had low points where we reached certain obstacles in fundraising. We got to a point where it's like, should we just throw in the towel? And a number of us stood there and said, but wait a minute, I can see it. I can <laughs> see it on the wall. So, you know, yes, there was pushback because people imagined the worst catastrophizing, right? <laughs> Instead of imagining, oh, it's going to be nice and educational, which is what we pointed out. We're going to contribute to the history and the education. It's going to have educational value. And that really turned out because when I think the day we got off the scaffolding in 1980, a school bus literally pulled into the parking lot. And tour buses. A tour buses. Tour buses, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. No, they, kept, they started coming through while we were still working on the mural. But, you know, the approval process, of course, you know, with any work of public art is usually long. The first people we had to convince was the telephone company. This was owned by the New England Telephone at the time. We're the one for you, New England. We're the one for you, New England. New England Telephone. Our Linux family. Nope. I remember that too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so one of our members, Shelley Shikoff, had to do a number of presentations to their staff. Because this is their building, I think. This is uh, their building. Yeah. They had yeah. to say, yes, we could do it. That was the first hurdle. Obviously, this was something completely new for Northampton, as it was. If this, you know, now murals are all over the place. You know, we they're common, and they but, really make a city vibrant. We're yeah. in Springfield all the time. Yeah. The murals there are incredible. They've been an important part of bringing new life and urgency to downtown. Technically, I think the Nelson Stevens murals predate yours, but that yeah. doesn't take away from yeah. any of the amazing 74. You know, uh, <laughs> well, this was also uncovering a history that was not written. Mm -hmm. And so there were oral histories that had to be done. Very old women that had the history. Um, and I think Wednesday Sorokin was really, she did a lot of oral history, I think. Yeah. She well, is one of the members. Wednesday Sorokin oh, and right. Rochelle Shikoff. Rochelle mm -hmm. Shikoff. They're not here today. Rochelle is doing a mural, Shelley, Florence, which is incredible. And uh, you know, Wednesday did a lot of the oral history and yeah. we compiled that history and came up with these people that were innovators that started businesses, like the button factory was started as a cottage industry in a woman's home that just exploded because buttons were a big covered, covered, buttons. covered, covered, covered buttons. buttons. But you know, the other thing we did was we had a kind of community forums where people from different parts of the community came and talked to us about what they wanted to see in the painting. Coming up, more with Linda Bond, Susan Pontius, Mariah Fee, and Rebecca Mueller of Mueller? Mueller. <laughs> of the Hestia Collective, including the community's reaction when unexpected setbacks occur mid-project. And later in the show, David Brule and Amalia Forhawks from the Pecumtuck Homeland Festival happening this weekend in Great Falls. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on NEPM. So here we are, we're just going to get started, everything's been approved, and we decide because this wall was comprised of three or four different materials, stucco and brick and concrete and flashing, that we would paint the entire wall one solid color first. And that color was going to be a, a kind of sienna color, which is what was, you, you know, sort of like that brick color over there, that dark brick mm -hmm. color. That would be the underpainting. So we went to the paint store, we were looking at swatches, we pick out the color, they deliver a hundred gallons of this, and we start spraying it on, and it is hot pink. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hot pink, like Barbie, right? Yeah. We were, well, it would be perfect for right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no. Hot pink. But, yeah. And the and community blew a stack. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then we had to put grid lines on. So we thought, okay, what would show up on the pink? So we put these green lines. So then there was this Blue green exactly. grid. And then we started the drawing. And the drawing was purple paint. So you have this pink wall, <laughs> this purple drawing, these great people were freaking out. But it were it actually worked out very well and as we progressed and people started to see the images emerging, then there was applause and relief yeah. and so <laughs> We're on Masonic Street in Northampton, where right now a restoration is in progress of a gigantic mural, the history of women in Northampton from 1600 to 1980. Copyright 
Hestia Art Collective. And we're joined by three members of the Hestia Art Collective. Linda Bond, Susan Pontius, Mariah Fee. By the way, we've just been joined by Rebecca Muller, who we've referred to earlier. I uh, had a job in the office, an office above in those buildings behind it. And my office literally overlooked the wall. And so I got to watch. I had this like ecstatic joy in this front row seat of watching every single step of change that went on in the wall that entire summer, fall, when they were looking. From the moments of the hot pink (laughs) to the purple and everything else. So, but you were instrumental in the restoration that happened in 2003? Yeah, and I think it began with that experience of just watching it. And while I wasn't at a place in my life where I could volunteer and join the join the crew so to speak i had a really intimate community-based relationship with it because i've i've lived here now for over 43 years what happened was the planning office uh put a note that's out in the gazette saying that the phone company was willing to continue to support the existence of the mural if people would come forward to re- restore it and in that at that point there was a lot of fading and some and some deterioration which really after we cleaned as a first step was much more minimal than we'd anticipated and that was also you know the sort of wonderful opportunity to sort of personalize some of the key figures up on the wall who'd been painted in as anonymous people and reflect the sort of continued history of women in Northampton over the subsequent, you know, 20 years. So it says updated and restored in 2003. What got updated in 2003? Let's start from left to right. And we personalized this counseling scene over here on the left with the woman in the red uh, blouse there. And that reflects an actual person who was a major activist around preventing domestic violence. Uh, Her name is uh, Yoko Kato. And she, uh, people might remember her, uh, her daughter got murdered and her baby son. So we reflected her. There was a a tremendous amount of diversity of people in the beginning, but then we just, we wanted to reflect that, those changes in the city. So we changed uh, skin tone in some places. And then the bulk of the changes were up in the, in the group activist scene up in the upper right. And so one of the women beginning under ERA that got painted in as an actual portrait was Gush Valenta, who changed girls uh, sports in the city. By the time my daughter was in the, in the public school system, she t- had changed everything. And, and so there were all these girls teams. Then Claire Higgins, uh, the former mayor of Northampton. The former mayor of Northampton, Mary Ford. Former mayor of Northampton. <laughs> um, the first woman president of Smith College, and then the first African American. Um, Ms. Simmons, Dr. Simmons, is up there, uh, African-American president of Smith College. Then I think the final one was Frances Crow, the uh, activist in our city who finally died at, over the age of 100 a few years ago. Mm, yeah. I didn't even notice her over there in yeah. the corner, but now I notice yeah. her. That's so great. Yeah. This is the third restoration of this mural. Because, underway right now. Underway right now. One happened in 86. That was so close to when the mural got finished. What happened that made that restoration necessary? Well, because the wall itself is not stable, because there's so many surfaces, you can see the brick at the top. And then as you move down, it's plaster, and there's that metal flashing. You can see evidence of some of the cracks. So with the water damage somehow getting underneath the the, um, plaster, there were some cracks in the wall. And as a result, some of the paint had come off. And actually, with the help of Smith College, they, they brought down a scissor lift. And so we were able to patch and then repaint. It wasn't a huge project like this. It was just, you know, a couple of sections. And so this restoration is really just a touch-up, basically? No additions or or just time? Everything needs to be painted over and over again, as any homeowner knows. Well, we had, we had, there was some graffiti damage. That's what Ah. started this. You know, most of it is not going to be changed, just those areas that were very visibly damaged. Are there other things that you think you would like to add or have people have the freedom to add over the course of the years as this sustains? No. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's time time for a new mural if that's what people want to do. I mean, the mural is itself right now is a complete work of art. You can't really add major 
figures or elements without changing the composition. So that would be the concern of the original artist is that this composition and this artwork is, you know, complete within itself. So, you know, the the adding of new figures is a is a delicate thing to, to do and, and you know, and maybe someday they'll just white it out and start all over again. <laughs> I would love to see a plan for ongoing stewardship. Oh absolutely and sustainability of absolutely yeah. and, yes. and and to cultivate future generations of young women and a community that is just this has become so important to them as an icon as evidenced by all the dialogues we have with people when somebody comes and works on the wall in our time in the 1980s there were no women role models I mean Susan Mariah and I were all in graduate school at um, UMass there were no women faculty maybe one <laughs> and there were no there were no women in the art history books and so for us, bringing forward these women at this moment in time, it's like, it was an important thing for us. So now, I mean, moving forward, we do have art history books with women in it. We do have museum shows with women. We do have public figures who are female. But this was a moment when that was not a reality. Girls, we run this mother. The celebration of the restoration of the Women's History Mural happens tomorrow night in Northampton, August 2nd, right in front of the mural itself at 5.30. They've set up a GoFundMe to help raise the remainder of the funds needed to finish the work, and you can find more information on that at today's show notes on our podcast page at nepm.org. There is a part of me that knew you were going to use that song. Yeah. I just knew. Well, you know, Beyonce is playing at Gillette tonight. I think. So uh, I had to play Beyonce. Okay. Yeah. Up next, David Brule and Amalia Forhawks join us to discuss the 10th annual Pecumtuck Homelands Festival happening this weekend in Great Falls. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on NEPM. Welcome back to The Fabulous 413. I'm Monty Belmonte. And I'm Cleese Smith. This weekend, the 10th annual Pecumtuck Homelands Festival, a celebration of Native American art, music, and culture, is happening at Unity Park in Great Falls slash Turner's Falls. And we'll get into the nuances between uh, why we're nuancing it that way uh, in just a little <laughs> Not bit. Not just for the person who emailed us about it. Yes, exactly. That's where I happen to live. And joining us is David Brule, who's a teacher, writer, and activist, and is a president of the Nolambika Project, which works to discover and preserve early indigenous sites in the Connecticut River Valley and to establish a bridge between our past and future generations. Brule grew up in Turner's Falls. We also are joined with, uh, joined by Amalia and with, <laughs> and with <laughs> Amalia Forhawks, who lives in Florence, owns and operates Firehawk Studios. She's been on the powwow circuit for many, many years. Thank you both for joining us here today. Good to be here. Uh, David, you walk by my backyard all the time in, right. in Great Falls and Turner's Falls. In Even this batch. Sunday, you get, have to get exposed to my topless sunbathing while I read the New York Times on Sunday. So I apologize for that in advance. Uh, I but, look forward to it each Sunday. <laughs> but I do, I'm so glad that you uh, have come to come to the studio here to talk with us. This festival is something that I've been to many times. It is in the town that I call home now. Um, but And we're calling it the 10th annual Become Tuck Homeland Festival. But really, we could call it the millennial old Pecumtuck Homeland Festival. Talk about the Pecumtuck Homelands and, and what that means. Yeah, great. So, yeah, we've, um, I like to picture this as a continuation of the uh, welcoming that the Pecumtuck always uh, afforded all the tribes who came to the falls in peace. But this goes back, we know, at least to 10 to 11,000 years. Uh, we of the Nolambika Project steward a uh, piece of land that overlooks the falls, and we have artifacts, going, we have found artifacts going back 11,000 years. So we know that that particular site has always been uh, an attractive place for indigenous peoples. So we know that. And let me, for those who have been in the area, you're on Route 2 now. Mm -hmm. The quote-unquote Mohawk Trail. We talked a lot about the uh, dispelling well, those rumors uh, yeah. with Rhonda Anderson a couple weeks ago. Um, but it's right where the bridge into Turner's Falls, the yep. village of Turner's Falls is, and the, the shining hills that are right there. Yes, right? exactly. So if you were crossing the bridge at that, uh, from that direction, coming from uh, Gill, then off to your left would be the ridge line that actually continues all the way to this celebrated uh, 
Poet's Seat Tower, and off to your uh, left, upstream would be the site of the Pocumtuck Homelands Festival. So, yeah, we, uh, we like to speak of this continuation of a, of a home, homelands because, as I said, uh, the welcoming aspect of the falls stewarded by the Pocumtuck uh, Nation uh, is, is a tradition that goes way, way back. And uh, not rare to uh, prized fishing places where most uh, Native nations agreed that when they came either to fish or to plant or to gather uh, ceremonial plants, uh, medicinal plants in the Montague Plains, for example, uh, Many came to find a spouse because many nations came together. So uh, we like to, the way I express it is you, if you came to the falls at that particular time in April and May, you left your issues at the door. You were welcomed, of course, but you were not to uh, be, uh, let's say, taking up uh, any kind of issues uh, uh, with other people who were gathering there. So we could say that there were, the Pocomtuck were stewarding it, but they, uh, they lived in very fluid uh, homelands between the Abenaki, some people say Abenaki, and the Nipmuc, who are their modern-day uh, descendants. Uh, so you have this place where the Pocumtuck and the Nipmuc and the Abenaki met at the falls in very fluid, uh, let's say, relationships. And then beyond those homelands, from the north came the Penacook and other uh, relatives of the Wabanaki, uh, the Narragansetts and, and uh uh, Wampanoag came from the coast. Uh, peoples came up from the south, for example, nearby here, the Agawam, who were really part of the kinship network with the Pocomtuck. So you had Agawam and Orinoco and uh, Nanatuk Nawadak. All of these peoples came to the falls. And we know from our archaeological findings that uh, we have uh, evidence of people coming in from as far as away as the Ohio. Ohio River Valley, so it was a, a huge place that, uh, let's say, a huge attraction, a very spiritual place. We know that many um, people from far away walked to this place, and some came to uh, finish their days on, on this, this earth and be buried there. So uh, it has always been a spiritual place. I like to joke when I'm talking with, with uh, some of the pupils where I uh, that I uh, work with, that even the dinosaurs love this place. <laughs> we know that, too. We know that perfectly, yes. It is that amazing. Is, it, it I mean, it, it, it's magical. I yeah. mean, it, it feels like a millennial older precursor to the United Nations, yeah. where all these nations decided we're going to just, we're going to lay down our differences for a bit and come to this mm -hmm. magical location. And it still feels magical, oh, even when you're there, even despite absolutely. the dam, even despite... Yeah, yeah. You know the the other history, the, the more sordid history mm -hmm. that gives the village its name. Right. Yeah. No, I feel like it, it, it's like conventions, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for lack of better term, but uh -huh. that's how what I equate it with, like people of like minds coming together and sharing resources, mm -hmm. etc., mm -hmm. and just like being together in the space that they love. Exactly. It's really nice. Yeah. yeah. We're speaking with David Brule, who's the president of the Nolambika Project, one of the organizing bodies behind this quote unquote 10th annual Become Tuck Homeland Festival. We'll really call it the 10 millionth. Yeah. Oh, well, 10,000th, yeah. maybe. 10, yeah, we won't, so go, we won't say, exaggerate. We didn't say the 10 millennia. 10 millennia of Become Tuck <laughs> Homeland Festival, as well as <laughs> Amalia Forhawks, who lives in Florence and owns and operates Firehawk Studios. Um, David grew up in the town known as Turner's Falls. You are you have come here. Tell us what brought you to Western Massachusetts and why this festival is important for you, Amalia. Well, the festival is important because of the heart that's going into it. Uh, the biggest part of the beauty of this festival, I mean, I've done art shows all over the country. I come to this festival because it still has that magic. I feel welcomed there. I see people that are coming from all other parts of the country. There's different nations that are coming. We set up side by side. Everybody's happy. Everybody's having a good time. There's been years where we would have a deluge 
of rain. And all the artists were still happy mm-hmm. <laughs> because of the the heartwarming welcome that we get from the Nolambika Project, the volunteers, the heartwarming welcome we get from the land itself. Invariably, we have eagles flying over the show. Uh, the people that come to the show, it's almost like they pass through a magic door and they come into the show and they're happy to be there, and they're friendly, and they're outgoing. So it's a joyful weekend. I have a friend who does healing work in, in other aspects, uh, aspects and another uh, black woman who posted your poster for the festival with the caption, this is what I look forward to every year. And mm-hmm. so it's not just that, like, it's so much wider and how welcoming it is and I feel like you should definitely know that I mean you clearly you know that because it's still happening Mm -hmm. (laughs) but it was nice to see like someone in in my community as well go like I love this like like more people should should be a part of this and feel it happening we're speaking with Amalia Fourhawks who owns and operates Firehawk Studios and is part of the Comtuck Homeland Festival, which will happen this Saturday and Sunday at Unity Park in Great Falls slash Turner's Falls. Again, we'll get a little bit into that story in just a bit. But tell us about your art, I was Amalia. literally about to say that. I was yeah. like, can you tell us about the art that you make yeah. at Firehawk Studios? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, Firehawk Studio is a combination of my husband and I. Um, we met about 40 years ago at an art show. And I did mostly beadwork, and he specialized in bone work and traditional crafts such as drum making. And so we had no choice but to fall in love and get married. (laughs) (laughs) And so that's where Firehawk came from. And we've gone through a lot of different modalities with our art over the years. But one of the strongest points that we've always tried to put forth. Even though my husband does traditional type work, he's always telling people, yes, it's traditional, but see, there's also this new edge to it. There's a new shape to a drum, or there's a new technique for creating things. I do a lot of sculptural work um, and still do a lot of beadwork. And I also try to incorporate modern things with the traditional things. We're trying to get people to understand that Native people are not just history, that Native culture is still very much alive. We're still active and evolving. The culture is growing. Our art is growing just like our culture is. So I've had people at shows, even at uh, shows like the Pecumtuck, I've had people say, but all the Indians are gone. Wow. When they are surrounded (laughs) by Native people (laughs) doing traditional art and contemporary art. And it's something that's just been drilled into the American psyche that Native Americans are history. No, Native Americans are really loud and we want to be recognized. (laughs) So come to the festival and look around. It's, again, like this is the thing that keeps popping up, and every time I'm just sort of like, I don't understand how you could possibly think this. And this is not just because I went to a high school where there were more indigenous kids than there were black kids. So, like, <laughs> out in Colorado, mm-hmm. but like, it just astounds me that this is the thing that continually pops up. Like, literally, you are at a festival that is celebrating the lives, the livelihoods, and traditions of indigenous people, and you can still say this to someone's face like please just take a minute step back take it all in and realize that maybe you might have been wrong about that Mm -hmm. well i mean a lot of it i think has to do with the educational system in this country as well as just the ideas behind the creation of the united states in some ways which erasure of indigenous culture and tradition has been historically what has happened in this country and the the resurgence of the ability to teach indigenous languages and all of is, is relatively recent. It was only in what year when uh, indigenous languages were not illegal to be taught in this country. <laughs> David Rule, historian from the Nolan Project. <laughs> yeah, well, certainly, um, 
there are some really prime examples of the Wampanoag uh, resuscitation of their language. Uh, I believe it's Jesse uh, Little Doe who participated in an incredible uh, renewal of her own Wampanoag language and uh, wonderful friends like uh, David Talpine White and uh, uh, Liz Coldwin Santana Kaiser from the Chobanagongog Band I have, have always reminded those who wanted to hear that, yeah, indeed, uh, Andre Strongbearheart says the same thing in his talks, that it was illegal to to teach his language uh, up until fairly recently. And there were laws on the books still in Boston where a, uh, a white person had the right to kill a Nipmuc person who ventured within the city limits. Of course, that never happened since, uh, let's say, you know, 100 years ago, 150, of course. But uh, those old laws uh, remind us, uh, just like that h- uh, horrific um, stone monument to Captain Turner that sits in Riverside, uh, reminds us of what the mindset was. And so that's kind of a little bit of my talk will, that I will be doing uh along with Evan Pritchard uh, at the festival. And I call my own talk This Gathering Place uh, so as to not dwell on those particular uh, terrible things that happened in one part of the continuum of the wonderful spirit and place that is uh, the Pesky Olmscott Falls. So, uh, yeah. The the erasure and the deliberate, uh, let's say, um, announcement of the uh, extinction of Native people, I mean, that's been ingrained in, in, in history. Growing up in Turner's Falls, we never read about the people gathering at the falls and what happened to them. We, I picked it up here and there from really erroneous signage and what people mentioned about the massacre but uh, never learned any of that in, at any time in the so-called Mo- town of Montague, Turner's Falls school system. So that's changing, I'll tell you that. Well, we'll hear, we won't dwell on it, but we should touch on it at least and mm-hmm. talk about that monument that's on Route 2 and Gill. Oh, sure. And talk about the celebration, though, that will happen and, and the healing that has gone on and moving forward with indigenous communities in our area when we come back from a break. We're speaking with David Brulf, who's the president of the Nolan Beaker Project and Amalia Fourhawks from Firehawk Studio in Florence will be at the uh, the Pocumtuck Homeland Festival this Saturday and Sunday. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on NEPM. Welcome back to The Fabulous 413. We're joined in the studio by David Brule, who's the president of the Nolan Beaka Project, as well as Amalia Fourhawks, who lives in Florence and owns and operates Firehawk Studios. They'll both be a part of the Pocumtuck Homelands Festival that are happening, which is happening this Saturday and Sunday. Now in its 10th millennia. 10th millennia, or 10th year of this re, uh, resurgence of this celebration. 10th year of this millennia. Uh, yeah, uh, along the banks of the Connecticut River. And Amalia, um, I had mentioned when I, I, I opened the door for you in the lobby that I asked if you were a vendor at the Pocumtuck Homeland Festival, and you said no. And I think that that's an important distinction to make. Well, when you asked the question, this kind of one of my little bugaboos about the terminology that's used with people will say, do you prefer Native American? Do you prefer American Indian? It's like when it said with respect, neither is wrong. Don't call me a vendor. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to say it with respect. <laughs> <laughs> to me, what a vendor is, is somebody who buys a product, puts a price mark up on it and sells it along. An artist creates a product, puts their heart and their soul into it, their ideas into it, and brings it to the public to be judged and to sell, to hopefully touch somebody else's heart. So that's how I term my participation in shows is I am an artist. I love it. In a similar vein, this gathering is not specifically a powwow. But there are similarities between those gatherings and this gatherings. Gatherings, goodness. Um, can we talk a little bit about the distinction? Yeah, it, it's 
And this is a very good distinction. It's not a powwow. You're not going to see a myriad of dancers in different categories. Uh, there's not going to be a lot of the drumming that people associate with a powwow. There usually is a drum group that participates. There's usually a dance troupe or not that participates. It's, this is an educational event. People can come here and learn. They can come here and see art that people from all different aspects have created. There's traditional wampum carvers. This is an art form. These people take the original quahog shells, the purple and white shells, and create incredible jewelry and art pieces. You can see there's going to be a wood carver there that does very specific native themed wood carvings that are intricate and detailed but they certainly don't look commercial. You can tell that this is an artist's love of their work. Um, there is a painter who will be there who does marvelous seascapes from her tribal background. So you're going to see a wide variety of art. And because this is not a powwow and it's not all, you know, hurry up and get to the dance circle and hurry up, people have a chance to walk around and slowly visit with the artists. It's a beautiful park and the bike path through it just begs for people to stroll along and look at the river and look at the art and stop and visit with the artists and ask about questions that they have. It's an amazing. It's really fun. It, it is a very relaxed and wonderful event. And there's wonderful music, some of which you've been hearing in the intros and outros. Hawk Henry's is going to be there, Nipmuc flute maker and player, the Blackhawk Singers, uh, Humble Spirit, and more. Our friend Justin Beatty, who's been on the show, is going to be there as an MC. And we're speaking with Amalia Fourhawks, as well as David Brule, who is the president of the Nolambika Project. And there's an event happening on Friday, too. It's not just Saturday and Sunday, but on Friday, there's a canoe mm -hmm. Tour, not quite tour, yeah, but it seems yeah. like exploration of that portion of the river. Also, can you talk about mm. that? Because it's also using like traditional canoes as part sure, of it. Sure. Yeah. Um, so we are really fortunate to, ha to have in our possession uh, what's called a mishun, which is a dugout, uh, burned out canoe log. It's about 17 feet long. Which and is this the same one that they were burning out at yes, previous Become yes, Home yes, Festival? So, so we saw the creation yeah, of this yeah, you can happening. Yeah. Right, you can see it at the the Nolambika Project website of the actual burning that went on for three days and three nights. Uh, that was the the, the boatmaster is Jonathan Perry, who is celebrated in in the northeast uh, of the uh, Quinnah Wampanoag, and so he oversaw that, and uh, we went uh, to Belchertown found an 18 foot long, uh, 48 inch wide white pine log and uh, brought it down to the shores of the Unity Park and we started burning it out when, you know, when, uh, as soon as we could. And so basically w when that was completed, COVID kind of intervened, but when that was completed, we uh, developed this, uh, let's say annual launch of the um, uh, Michoon and in conjunction with the Connecticut River Conservancy, great friends and powerful organization, and uh, with Adventure East, this is a, uh, a firm that leads, uh, takes people out on, on uh, hikes and uh, uh, experiences on the water. Uh, we are uh, going to be going out, uh, conditions willing, yeah, um, right. on, on Friday. We'll, we, we will launch on uh, around 10 o'clock and paddle up river through the narrows now the narrows is very important for me because i literally grew up at the narrows my family home was maybe a hundred feet up the hill from that particular place which is pretty magical because there were three waterfalls prehistoric times and in one place it, the R connecticut river broke through and that's where the narrows are so you have these uh, red rocks coming together with a small narrow gap to shoot, to reach uh, the, the lower part of the, the Peskyomskut Falls. So we'll be going up through there, uh, probably uh, going up one side of the peninsula on the, on the um, western side, crossing the river, stopping at a beach to tell stories, and then on the way back. So 
Uh, usually it's about a three, three hour paddle, but um, it's it's a, an incredible experience for everybody who's participated. And uh, the Wampanoags uh, provide the the crew. So, singing on the river, it's incredibly magical to hear these ancient voices, the songs going out to the landscape that have not been echoing any of these native words for a thousand years, or at least certainly since the massacre at the falls when everything shut down we brought it back we we don't claim credit but people like diane dix has been an incredible organizer and pivotal in launching this become the homelands festival that's very welcoming exactly like you said it i couldn't have said it even any better Wonderful place, wonderful time of year. That's David Brule, who is the president of the Nolan Beaker Project. And Amalia Fourhawks joins us as well from Firehawk Studios. We keep mentioning Turner's Falls, Great Falls. You've mentioned the massacre several times. I'll give you the brief history, but I want to pick your brain about one particular part of it. The Nolan Beaker Project, first of all, is doing a battlefield study about the actual history of what went on in this massacre in 1676 mm-hmm. in May. Yes. I'm getting it all right May so 19th. far. Good, Captain yeah. William Turner, a Baptist, <clears throat> not allowed to practice his own religion, but commandeered by the powers that be in the British government at the time to go and massacre the women and children that were sitting at the falls while a hunting party was not there. Mm-hmm. Um, it was nothing short of a massacre, nothing short of a, a, a mini genocide. Good mm-hmm. Christian principles. Right. Um, and yet a conflicted character who wasn't allowed to worship in his own way, too. It doesn't justify murdering all these people. And yet... The village is now called Turner's Falls, Mm -hmm. even grammatically incorrect, um, with a monument that sits on en route to Ingill. What I think goes unsaid, but that I've learned from you in the past, and uh, there's all all sorts of debate. Should we call it Great Falls? Should we call it Turner's Falls? Should we call it Peskyumskit? What should we call this village? Should we just call it Montague and leave it at that? (laughs) The, who was the lieutenant who served under Captain William Turner? Yes, that was uh, Lieutenant Holyoke, correct? And so, yeah, he had uh, quite a role. He survived the massacre. Um, we don't know whether Turner actually said this in the panic because the native forces counterattacked, and that was what we have been, uh, let's say, um, discovering and uh laying out the information of. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so our, our uh, Lieutenant Holyoke survived the, the, uh, the panic, but died very shortly later, what we would probably now, of what we would call PTS, uh, the, the, the uh, post-stress traumatic syndrome. So anyway, that's, that's him himself uh, about Holyoke. So it's interesting that the debate goes on to should we call it Turner's Falls, but mm-hmm. no one brings up Holyoke as a name that's yeah. complicated yeah, in yeah. the situation. But, someone is, but att- yet someone attempted to call Rock Dam Holyoke Falls ah. right oh. near your house. Yes, which Didn't is right happen. down river. I'm, I'm glad, <laughs> Maybe no. I'm glad for that. <laughs> and yet this will continue the the apart from that one day in 1676 aside, it carries on a millennia long tradition of gathering together in peace and joy and love and laying our differences aside, celebrating art and celebrating culture and tradition while moving that tradition forward. And the forward. wealth of peoples who are still here. The wealth of peoples who are still here, some of whom you can meet. This Friday you about their various histories. Saturday and Sunday <laughs> on the banks of the Connecticut River. Yeah, a good a good twenty plus nations will be represented. That's so cool. Thank yeah. you. That's <laughs> incredible. Thank you so much to David Brule, who's the president of the Nolan Bika Project, as well as Amalia Fourhawks from owns and operates Firehawk Studio and is an artist who will be on the banks of the Connecticut River at the Becumtuck Homeland Festival this Saturday and Sunday. Thank you both so much. Tomorrow on the Fabulous 413, this year has been pretty disastrous for agriculture, but there are folks on the ground helping to assess the safety of the soil as the area slowly dries out. We'll talk to some of the experts at the UMass Extension about how much of a toll our area has actually taken and some of the worrying things that may head our way if things continue to be wet and steamy. Plus, Ursat's word nerd, Ammon Shea, hops in the saddle again to help us take a look at the language. If you've got a question for our word nerds, you can send them to us, the Fab 413 at nepm.org, or text... 800-639-9120. Our director is Tony running at 60% done. Our engineer is Betsy feeling the weather internally lanked-o. Our technical team is Bart Deja Vu, Computer Problems, Rankin, and Kara Foster, who is better than most of the kids in the country, and Punk Road Boy Dubay. Musical thanks to Spouse, Happy Valley Guitar Orchestra, Janelle Monet, Helen Reddy, Shaka Khan, Beyonce, Hawk Henrys, who's playing the Become Talk Homeland Festival, and the Black Hawk Singers, who are also playing at the Become Talk Homeland Festival. <laughs> I'm Kali Smith. I'm Monty Belmonte. See, See you tomorrow, tomorrow on the, the Fabulous, fabulous 413. 413.